going on, everybody? And thanks for tuning back in to another episode of Florida Prison Talk. Got my boy Chad Marks in the building. If you don't know who Chad Marks is, he's the author of a book you can find on Amazon called Blood on the Razor Wire. I have read this book two times on Amazon. I read it thoroughly. This book has 40 chapters of straight fire. It's no, it's no idle time in this book. This book is steady going. It's, it's steady. You're not going to be able to put this book down at all. I read this book before Chad even hit the YouTube thing. I was like, wow, what a coincidence. I read this book and here he is on um, DOC channel. Like I've, I've knew about that book already, man. So that's, that's a fact, man. But um, go to introduce yourself, Chad. Okay. My name's Chad Marks. I'm from Rochester, New York. At the age of 24, I was arrested for my involvement in a crack cocaine conspiracy. The government alleged that I was the leader in that conspiracy. I had a plea agreement for 10 years. I didn't take that. I proceeded to trial. All of my good friends supposedly testified on me. I ended up with a 40 year federal mandatory minimum, went to prison, took myself to the law library, learned the law, was able to um, write my own motions and secure my release from prison. While I was learning the law, I was able to help other brothers get out of prison on their own cases. I've won over 100 cases. I've helped people like Russell Simmons' son. I won his case. He's back in court now, um, his foster son. I also am working on the rapper Lil Baby's father's case right now. We're hoping for a good outcome out of that. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff, but this isn't just about me. It's about the brothers and sisters that are left behind. I left prison, and I'm doing everything that I said I would do, and that is to free the people and be the voice of the voiceless. Wow, I like that introduction. That's fire. Okay, we're getting right into this interview. You just told him what led you there. Let me go back to a little bit. I mean, let me back up a little bit. Um, When you got sentenced to those 40 years and you landed on that federal prison, did you see light at the end of the tunnel? How was your mind feeling like 40 years? What's, your, what's, what's going on in your mind, Chad? Well, I was 24 with a 40-year sentence. I was going to, in my opinion, the most dangerous prison in the United States, right? Everybody talked about USP Big Sandy. It's dangerous there. There's other dangerous places like Victorville and USP Lee and Hazleton. But at that time, when I went to Big Sandy, it was the most dangerous prison, hands down. There's some dangerous state prisons, but Big Sandy was dangerous. I walked in there hoping that some way, somehow I could get out of prison. But in my mind, I think I felt like, man, I'm probably never getting out of here. And, you know, a lot of people might lie and say, oh, I wasn't scared. Most people that walk into that prison, they're scared. They're nervous. So honestly, I was a little bit scared, but at the same time, there was a part of me that didn't care if I got killed or if I lived. I mean, I felt like I didn't have the balls to kill myself. So if I went in there and someone killed me, well, then I wouldn't do the 40 years. It wasn't until later on when I started to change, you know, my thought process and things started to matter. And I started to think it is possible that I can get out of prison. And I started to change my life. I educated myself, got a college degree, you know, taught leaders, breed leaders. I, I facilitate alternative violence project seminars. But yeah, truthfully, I wasn't always a nice guy. That didn't come till later on. Okay, okay. And let's get right into the, the federal prison system. I hear so much stuff about USP Big Sandy. I have an uncle that was in USP Big Sandy. And let me um ask you this, because the federal politics are different from the state politics. You being white, when you got to USP Big Sandy, you had to report to the whites, right? Well, as soon as I walked in there, they surrounded me and asked me who I ran with. And some of that stuff was new to me. So I'm like, I'm unsure what to say. And they're like, well, you're white, right? You, you run with the whites, right? Like it was a leading question. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I run with the whites. So it was racially segregated. Let me just be clear, right? It isn't because you necessarily want to be racially segregated, but it's just the way that things work there. Like the black dudes may not have accepted me if I wanted to go that side. And then I would be frowned upon by the whites and I, it just wouldn't, I, it wouldn't work out. I wouldn't make it. And like I talk about in my book, you know, we had a white mop bucket. They had a black mop bucket, a black broom, a Hispanic mop. And I couldn't use that and they couldn't use ours. So it was definitely racially segregated, brother. Okay. And, and what gangs was on that compound when you were there? Did they have when the Aryan Nation? Well, they had, yeah, they had the Aryan Brotherhood out of California. They had um, armed Aryan resistance militia. They had some sack dudes, soldiers of Aryan culture. You had the Serenios, the Mexican mafia. You had Crips over there. Um, you, you had, you know, other Mexicans, the Paisas. I don't know if people really know what the Paisas are, but those are people that are from, you know, natives of like Mexico and 
Guatemala. They had some of the Paisas there, but they ended up getting into it with the Serenios, the South Siders, the Black Hands, Mexican Mafia. So they got them off the yard. I think they stabbed a couple of them and got them out of there. But there was different gangs. But not all white gangs can be on the same yard together either. You have gangs like the Dirty White Boys that are despised. I talk about them in the book a little bit. Uh, the government alleged that I was part of that gang at one point in time. Not saying that that's true, but that's what the government alleged in my in my court papers to try to keep me in prison. So, like, certain gangs can't be with other gangs, man, because it's it'll be definitely be some issues. And that's what I'm saying. What's the problem with the dirty white boys? Why don't the Aryans or want them on the compound with them? They I, they had a beef where one of their dudes were hit, so now it was a constant beef. Dirty white boys are frowned upon. You know, they act like you know these guys are the guys that will extort and take from other whites. But at the same time, you see some of these other white groups doing the same stuff. So it's really a bunch of nonsense in my okay. world. A bunch of nonsense. And tell me, before you went to USP Big Sandy, when you was at the holdover, did you hear about it before getting there? Oh, yeah, I heard about it. But I was designated to an FCI. Oh. From, I was held in, in, in Youngstown, Ohio. Went from Youngstown, Ohio to Brooklyn. I had a physical altercation in Brooklyn. They redesignated me and sent me to Big Sandy. And Let's back up. What did you have a physical altercation over? What, what, what was that about? It was over a handball game. I ended up um, I ended up beating this kid up out of Vermont really bad. But this is the crazy part. They didn't see it. Someone else went and told. They put us both in the hole. They redesignated me, and me and him were on the same bus going to Big Sandy on the same day. When wow. we got there, he was like, look, when I got there, my homeboys had the yard for the white dudes. And when I mean my homeboys, I'm from New York, so we had a New York-Boston car there. So my homeboys had the yard, and immediately he was outnumbered, man. He's from Vermont. He can't make it. He apologized, didn't want no issues, and wanted to move forward. But while we were in Brooklyn, he was a tough guy. He was trying to, you know, punk some of the dudes on the handball court. And not to big myself up, but he tried to, you know, punk me a little bit. And I told him, let's just go ahead and catch that room. And honestly, I beat the kid up pretty bad. So okay. end of the story was he didn't really want no issues. He ended up getting in our car. My homeboys accepted him because, you know, there's power in numbers in federal prison. That's and, right. you know, things went out. So you guys ended up being okay, though, after that? We ended up being okay. Um, if, if I would have lost, we probably wouldn't have been okay. But <laughs> he, he was willing to accept it. So, yeah. That's good, Jay. That's good. Okay. Um, Why did you name your book Blood on the Razor Wire? What's so significant about that name? Well, Blood on the Razor Wire – is significant because of this because while i was in big sandy right i had read other prison books and i'm like wow these books are nothing compared to what i'm really seeing the these people that wrote these books couldn't tell the story that i could tell because they never experienced what i experienced they had never been in the prisons that i had been and i felt like every time someone got murdered at big sandy or someone got stabbed i would say to myself just another one with his blood left on the razor wire i used to say that and i was like that'll be the perfect title for my book when i write it so eventually I ended up writing the book and that's what the title was. I was going to name it Humanity's Hell and I switched to Blood on the Razor Wire because I feel like there was so much blood left on that razor wire over there, on that fence, on that wall. Got you. Okay, so when you got to USP Big Sandy, how long did it take for trouble to find you? How long did it take for your first incident? And what happened with that? Well, one of my very first incidents, and I don't even think I talk about this in the book, I might... Um, there was an issue over some baseball cleats with a guy, and he was alleged to be associated with the Dirty White Boys. His name was Barry. He was out of Missouri. He uh, Something happened with some cleats, and he said that I said something that I didn't say, so I went out on the handball court. Now, this is when I wasn't a nice guy, right? I was a young guy, 40-year sentence, got a little size on me. And I said, hey, I never said that what you said. And he's like, yes, you did, and I just hit him. Boom, boom. He fell down the wall. People were like, oh, man, chill. The police came. And they're like, look, we're not taking you guys to the hole, but you're going to go your way, I'm gonna go, and you're going to go his way. And that's it. He went his way, I went my way. So that was my very first incident. My next incident I talk about in the book, you might remember, um, was on the baseball field, where one of the guys on my baseball team in my car disrespected everybody and invited people to his private parts, right? Yes, and that's yes sir. That's new. And there was, you know, other races out there and things like that, so... I immediately put my hands on him to stop it from becoming a race issue. And I tagged him a couple times and I was eventually in an incident. And I'm going to talk about this on my, on my YouTube channel as well with another guy that was there while I was there. I ended up getting jumped after some things happened in my car and the shot callers went to the hole. 
some dudes ended up jumping me on the basketball court. One of the dudes was shot from the gun tower with an AR-15. They shot him in the back, blew his guts out. Not in my incident, but a year later. Uh, his name was Ace. He was out of Ohio. He's now dead, but he had like 300 years. He didn't really care if he lived or died anyway. I'm saying, so why did they jump you for? For what? Well, really, I had a friend from New York named Vic, right? And he was a Puerto Rican dude. And I lived in that unit. They ended up wanting me to move to the other unit. And there was some conflict with one of my homeboys that ended up stabbing the CO. There was some conflict between me and him where, you know, he wanted to be a tough guy. I didn't really let him, you know, tough guy me at all. And what happened was once they went to the hole, there were other dudes that were kind of like, yo, we kind of want you to lead the car. And there was other people with Ace that wanted Ace to lead the independent car. And what happened with Ace was he called me out on the yard and was like, look, you got all these dudes following you, this and that. And I'm like, look, dude, I don't want to be the shot caller. I'm cool. I mean, you could be the shot caller, but you're not going to tell me what to do. You could be the right. shot caller for all these dudes. I'm a leader. I'm a leader in the streets and I'm a leader in here. But I don't want the trouble that comes with being a shot caller. And so your viewers know a lot of dudes that got sentences like that, 200, 300 years, they have nothing left. So all they got is they want to have the keys to the car. They want to be the boss. They want to be the leader. They have nothing left. So that makes them get through each day. And he wanted to be the leader. And he said something to me, you know, some, some stuff about, oh, you're hanging out with the blacks and use some derogatory names. And he hit me. And once he hit me, you know, things happened. He hit me and he tried to pull my, um, I jumped back and he was trying to pull my long john off me. So I got the long john off and I'm hitting him, boom, boom, and I'm moving, I'm tagging these dudes. And one of the dudes had a knife and he didn't stab me. And Ace was yelling at him, stab this bitch, stab this bitch. Damn. And he hesitated. And I was so scared, my heart was pumping. I've seen people killed here. So he hesitated with the knife, but when he hesitated, he didn't stab me. I hit him, he fell. One of the homeboys grabbed the knife, threw it in the drain. And then there was three or four of them. I'm fighting with all these dudes. They're shooting from the gun tower. Everybody hits the ground when they shoot from the gun tower. I don't hit the ground. I grab the kid ace by his shirt and start hitting him. Because I feel like these dudes are trying to jump me. I'm getting this dude. You know what I mean? Right. Long story short, the cops run out there. I'm probably 30, 40 cops. It was an old lieutenant. He hit me. He hit me so hard, he knocked my shoe off. I left that yard with one shoe on, one shoe off. And I ended up getting transferred. When I got to the next prison, I only had one sneaker. My sneaker was still over there in the, in the rec yard. Damn. But and, I made it. And by the grace of God, I made it, man. And earlier you said somebody, somebody stabbed the CO? Yeah, my celly, uh, my celly stabbed the CO and ended up getting another 25 years. Wow. So the CO took a gallon of wine from him and he told me, so I'm going down here to stab this dude. I mean, there was more to it where one of the other homeboys went down there. You read about that in the book. The cop tackled him, pulled his pants down. Everybody's laughing. Yes. So... Adam said, look, I'm going to I'm going to handle this. And he went down there and he stabbed the CO about 10 times. Damn. That's um have you ever seen anybody get anybody killed at USP Big Sandy? Yeah, I have. Can you speak on that? Yeah, I've seen, well, not actually see, but I seen when they took a, took the dude out of his uh cell. Another guy stabbed his celly in the head. And this guy came from USP Lee. And for stabbing people, he stabbed the celly in the head, left a knife in his head. I've seen him take the dude out of the cell with a piece of steel, probably about a foot long, sticking out of his out of his head, man. And Damn, he was, man. Yep. A guy named Roscoe. That kid ended up going to uh, trial down there, and he got a, he already had a life sentence, got another life sentence. Like I'm not on your show telling on people. I'm just saying things that right. you know, dudes already found guilty and stuff like that. If not, I wouldn't be on here saying that type of stuff. That's right. That's right. And how about, um, I hear people talk about the COs be beating ass and whooping on them. How about the corruption? You seeing COs beat on inmates? I'm going to tell you this right here, right? I don't like to use the word inmate, no disrespect to you, but I use okay. the word prison, right? Okay. Um, I never seen the police in USP Big Sandy or any USP beat on any prisoners. And I'm going to tell you why. Because dudes in there got nothing to lose. Most of the guys in there got 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years life. Never getting out. If they put their hands on a person in there, there's going to be repercussions. And usually it's not just the CO putting his hands on the one dude and them two fighting. Your car is coming. There's dudes in there that got life that are in your car. And they're willing to do whatever it is. Kill the cop, whatever it is. They're willing to do that. I don't, I'm not saying that, you know, that people should do that type of stuff. But those are the type of things that happen. Now, when you go to a lower level prison, I've seen some things happen. I've seen, you know, Cops do some bad things to people in a low. When I made it to a low, I seen them get smart in an FCI, but 
you know, cops just beating up federal prisoners. It happens, but it happens when you get to a lower level. I actually had a fight with a correctional officer, a guard in um, USP Coleman. I was on the I was on the door, you know, woofing with him, selling woof tickets for real. And he's like, I'm going to get you out of the cell. You're going to come down here. We'll go in the laundry room. And once he did that, he called me out in front of everybody. They unlocked my cell. I believe that was in 2010. Things have changed since then. But we went in the laundry room and we fought like men. And I'm going to keep it real with you. He didn't win and I didn't win. But we were two, two big white dudes bent over, breathing hard, talking about you had enough. And I left, I left the incident with a black eye. And I mm. said, yeah, I got enough. You had enough? He said, yeah. And then I respected him after that, and he respected me. They didn't come in there. They didn't jump me. He took the walkie-talkie off, and, and we handled our business, and that was it. But I got okay. a lot of respect after that. Okay. And let me – um, USP, I'm going to be on USP, Big Sandy. I, I, gotta, I want these viewers to know the kind of violence that happens at these, at these institutions, especially USP, Big Sandy. Let me ask you something. Out of all the gangs there, which gang would you say was the most deadliest? I would say the Southsiders, the Mexican Mafia, in every single federal prison. They are the most dangerous gang. I mean, I respect them dudes. They're respectful. But if you get out of line with them dudes, there's a no hands-on policy, man. They're stabbing you. They don't care if you're the warden. They don't care who you are. Them dudes are, them dudes are about their business, man. Okay. Most dangerous and, gang in prison. To me. And I'm looking at you, man. I've, I've seen your videos and stuff. I've seen different lengths that you've been on. And you seem like a pretty hip dude, man. You got swag. It seems like you like, I can tell you've been, or you grew up around black people. I can say that much. With that being said, did you get a lot of wrath from talking to black inmates and USP Big Sandy from the white inmates? Did they come down on you for that? Well, in our car, I'm from New York. So a lot of the other dudes are from New York too. But there was some stuff like, and I talk about it in my book, where it's just like, hey, it's better to play sports with our own people, stick with our own people. You know, you can talk to them. And Adam, Adam was from New York too, so Adam knew what it was. It like we weren't allowed to buy food from blacks. Like if they made pizzas or sandwiches, you're like, look, you can't do business with them. The Mexicans, we were allowed to do some business with. But did I get some flack? Man, my best friend over there for real on the low was a Puerto Rican dude named Vic Lorenzano that's serving 85 years. I just did his case too, trying to get him out. He was really my best friend in there, man. He wasn't in my car, but he was from New York. Did I get some flack? I did get some flack, man. I did get some flack. Where they In the beginning, they told me, yo, you can't eat with them dudes because one of my homeboys made some steaks and all that that they stole out of the chow hall. And that's how my really, like right off the bat, the, one of the gang members was like, yo, you can't hurt your eating with these dudes. And you know, using vulgar words, whatever. And I was pretty much like, man, I don't give, I don't give a fuck what you say. How about that? Right. I'm from New York. I do what I want to do. And I don't mean to That's swear right. on your show, but it is what it is. It's a prison show, right? Exactly. Exactly. So I, I, pretty much, I told dude, like, man, I don't give a fuck who you are, man. You don't tell me what to do. And I was already a young gunner, man, with a 40 year sentence, so I didn't care. I'm ready, whatever. But I got a little flack. But I, honestly, I knew my position, man. I could get killed in there, right? So I played right. by the rules. I'm not trying to act like I circumvented the rules or I was like, man, I don't care what them dudes said. I'm the baddest dude on the prison yard. Right. But that's not true. I did fall. I did fall in line, man, because I had to. And that's but a fact. To some blacks here and there. Yes. There were some blacks that wouldn't want to talk to me. I got you. And explain to the viewers, man, when you roll with the whites, it don't mean you racist. It's just part of the politics, right? Unfortunately, that's what it is. It's part of the politics. Um, and I can say this on your show, when I made it to a lower level, man, you know, I changed my life. I've helped more black dudes get their GED and help them, you know, become leaders than any other race. And some of my really close friends, one of them, Cedric Dean, did 25 years in the penitentiary. He taught me everything I know. And he was like one of my closest, closest friends. And he's a black dude out of North Carolina, out of Charlotte. And he's okay. doing big things, um, saving kids from life imprisonment and premature death. So everything that I learned came really from Cedric Dean. But, yeah, I helped a lot of people. Guy Fisher. Man, Guy Fisher was like a father figure to all of us. I don't care what color you were, man. If you were from New York, you know, we respected Guy Fisher. I got pictures with him, put me in a headlock. But this is in a lower security prison. If we were in Big Sandy, I wouldn't have took a picture with Guy Fisher putting me in a headlock. No okay. matter how much I respect him because you can't do that stuff. Okay. And what kind of person was Guy Fisher? Oh, man. One of the best dudes I ever met, man. And, um... Sometimes I get a little emotional about his situation, but he's home. He's free now. I mean, one of the best guys I ever met, educated, didn't deserve to be in prison that long. 
he went to prison without a GED. He left with a doctorate degree, right? So it's Damn. Dr. Fisher, first okay. black man to ever own the Apollo Theater. They, they should be doing a movie about Guy Fisher, man. I, the guy's a phenomenal dude, went out of his way to help people. You know, if there was incidents, he would intervene. You know, he would stop violence from happening. I mean, this guy is a good person, man. That's what I can say about Guy Fisher. Okay. And when you met Guy Fisher, how many years did he have in prison already? When I met Guy Fisher, I met him in Arizona before it became a child molester prison. I want to say I probably met Guy Fisher in 2012. And then we were in Arizona and they changed the, the mission statement there. So they started bringing other different people in there. We both left. We went to Raybrook in New York. We're both from New York. I ended up leaving Raybrook after about five or six years. And um, he ended up leaving and he went to Yazoo. I went to um, a lower security prison in Lexington, Kentucky. So okay. we split up at that point. But I've known him for okay. years. Okay. And then um, I noticed in the book, you was a, I noticed in the book, man, that when you first got there, you was about to be sold with a black person. And a white guy went to the guards and told him you can't be sold there. So I say that to say this. So you mean to tell me that the, the, the prisoners de decide what cell people go into? 100%. They okay. tell the cop what cell you're going to. Wow. Just, like, just let me know when you're ready. Just tell me what cell. And then he'll change it in the book. And then that's what cell you go into. Hmm. OK. And also in your book, you said that you wondered every day if it was going to be your last day on Earth. Big Sandy was it was just that bad, huh? It was that bad. It was mentally exhausting. They used to have fog counts in the morning, right, where it would get foggy and they'd lock you in your door because they had to count you. And then you could come out after the fog. I used to pray for those days just so I could get some sleep because I used to be so mentally exhausted that I was like, wow, you can't sleep there. I mean, you can sleep when they lock you in. But when they opened that door, and back then, I think they used to open the doors at like 5.15. At 5.15, you better be up and ready. You can't sleep. Your homeboys will beat you up if you're sleeping. You just can't okay. do it. Let's say I was sick, right? If I was sick and I'm like, I need some rest, I got to lay down. One of my homeboys had to stand outside my door, sit outside my door while I'm sick and, and I'm sleeping or whatever. Damn, that's like being, I was in the Marine Corps. That's like fire watch for us. And I noticed another thing um, in the book. So when you actually, when you're taking showers, you have to have somebody outside the shower as like standing guard? 100% with a knife. You go to the shower with a knife and whoever's holding you down goes to the shower with a knife. He's standing outside with a knife. I got a shower in the knife. I, I got a knife in the shower with me. Wow, man, that's crazy. Okay. Let me go to the um the Aryan Brotherhood. Are, what, are they as dangerous as people say they are when you was in the USP Big Sandy? Did they not play? Definitely dangerous. Definitely dangerous. Okay. Okay. Their numbers are down now. And now that all the old timers are gone and stuff like that, but they're still dangerous, dangerous gang. Okay. And hey, hit that like and subscribe button, y'all. Y'all make sure y'all check out that book, Blood on the Razor Wire, Chad Marks. It's a great read. And I'm going to refer back to the book right now for the, um, you had in the book, explain to the viewers about how people confront and act like they all big and bad. But when it all comes down to it, they not really living like that. Talk about the skinhead guy in the book. I'm oh, not going to give that the book away. Yeah. I'm skin the kid Shamrock. So when I get on the bus, there's a kid named Shamrock, right? And he's talking all this tough guy stuff, and I'm listening to him. But he's just a little fella, right, out of Wisconsin. I'm listening to him talk, and I'm just, like, frustrated with this dude. Like I wish this dude would shut up with all these war stories and all this stuff. I, I didn't like the dude off the rip. But we get to the prison. When we get to the prison, what happens is this. He ends up going in to talk to the SIS and the captain, and they come out and put him in a separate cell. So all the tough guy stuff that he was talking, he checked into PC. He told him that he couldn't walk the yard. And there was a reason for that because he was at another prison that something happened with some of his gang brothers, and he wasn't there to help. He ran or he hid. Something happened. So when he got the Big Sandy, he knew that his homeboys were on the yard, that he couldn't make it. So he told him, look, I can't go out there. So he checked into protective custody. And years later, I ended up seeing him. I was with him in USP Coleman down there in Florida. And we were in a dropout gang member yard at that time. And I had seen him, and they ended up, his homeboys ended up getting him. They kicked all his teeth out. So he had no teeth anymore. He was about 34 years old with no teeth. Mm. They kicked his teeth out. Okay. And you say you got jumped by a bunch of guys. You almost got stabbed. After that incident, you got transferred to USP Lee, which is another United States. Keep them, hey, viewers, keep in mind now he's speaking of 
This, 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 we're not talking about FCIs right now. This is USP Big Sandy to USP Lee. So after that incident at USP Big Sandy, when you got jumped and almost got stabbed, did you have any problems from that incident at USP Lee that people knew about? Like, yo, you, this, did you have any problems at USP Lee? From no, the I, didn't have any, I didn't have any problems there because I had a lot of homeboys when I got there, right? And eventually, and there's dudes that were in there with me. Eventually, I ended up getting the car for the East Coast there, right? At USP Lee. I, I was stabbed at USP Lee. I had some things happen over there, but... No, when I got to USP Lee, it was mostly independent dudes and a bunch of my homeboys, and I was fine when I got there. Okay, well, you know I'm going to ask you this. What happened with the stabbing at USP Lee you just mentioned? Can you speak on that? When I got stabbed at USP Lee, this is what happened at USP Lee. I had a guy that was a serial killer out of Washington, D.C. He owed me $45. I had sold him some stamps. Stamps is currency in federal prison. I sold him some stamps for some commissary. He didn't pay me. So what happened was he stabbed me in the back when I was walking up the steps. When he stabbed me, I reached back, touched my back. And I seen blood on my hand. One of my co-defendants was there with me. And I yelled down the steps, hey, he stabbed me. Get him, because he stabbed me. And then he took off. So my friend started like chasing him at first. And then it registered like, oh, he stabbed him. My friend stopped. I think he got scared. But I kept chasing the dude. I caught him. I took the knife from him. And honestly, I could have killed the dude because I hit him probably 20 times in the face. I took the knife from him, threw the knife off to the side, and just pounded him out. Um, the cops tackled me. They started punching me, but I told the cops, I said, hey, I'm stabbed. I'm stabbed. And then that's when they went into shock. They picked me up in the air. These two cops were strong enough to pick me up in the air by my arms, like my feet off the ground, and they ran me to medical. And I'm like, I'm dying. I'm dying. But really, I wasn't, but I was scared. I, I thought I was dying. I'm like, I'm stabbed. I'm stabbed. I didn't want to die. So when I got down there, they stuck a big Q-tip in my back, and they're like, hey, you're good. But let me tell you something. There was another dude that got stabbed the next day or the day before me, and they stuck a Q-tip in his, wherever he was stabbed, in his neck or whatever, and they told him he was good and didn't take him to the hospital. He died from internal bleeding in the hole. And Damn. When they, when they took me to the hole, they put me outside in the wreck cage, and they checked me with the Q-tip. They said I was good. They left me in the wreck cage for about two hours, and after your adrenaline starts flowing, I had to pull myself up on the wall, and when they came to get me, I couldn't stand up. But I ended up walking myself to the cell. I get to a cell with one of the homeboys from New York. And he's like, damn, man, what's up? I'm like, man, I'm stabbed. And he's like, look, I'm going to put you on the bottom bunk. He moved the bunks. And I remember just sliding into that bunk. And I didn't get up to use the bathroom for two or three days. And I didn't eat for two or three days. I just laid in the bed sleeping. I, just, I was so like, I don't know what happened. I was, I was pretty messed up, man, for real. Once my adrenaline stopped flowing. Wow. We're going to definitely have to do another part to this. Okay. So, damn, that's crazy. Let's speak on um the DC Blacks. Did you come across any DC Blacks? Yeah, of course. 100%. Okay. Speak. Can you speak about them a little bit? What kind of people are they? How you know about the DC Blacks? I'm a I'm a, I'm a prison journalist. This is all I do is study this. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Okay. So yeah, the DC Blacks. Let me tell you this. Dangerous dudes, right? A lot of them are dangerous dudes. A lot of them are disrespectful disrespectful in the manner that they're gunners that um there's so many of them they don't really care they'll disrespect people but there's some gangsters in there too don't get me wrong and there's some real men that are from dc right and what i be my mean by real men is i mean respectful but killers at the same time and they try to keep the younger guys a lot of them guys try to keep the younger guys in on a straight line but sometimes it's just too hard i mean i've seen some of the dc shot callers beat up the younger dudes and the younger dudes go to the hole, come back out, and they're still doing nonsense. Mm. So, you know, a lot of people are, well, you know, you probably heard a lot of rumors about the D.C. dudes, rape dudes, and all that stuff. Because, you know, that that's really a thing. That a, really, I mean, I didn't really see D.C. dudes raping dudes. Let's just put it that gotcha. way. I mean, gotcha. does it happen? Do people get raped in prison? Yeah, it happens. I mean, it does happen. But a lot of them D.C. dudes are homosexual. I'll, I'll give you that. But when you got a real shot caller on the yard from D.C., they handle their business, man, and they keep people in line. Got you. Explain to the viewers, man, Um, because I noticed, like I said, I read the book twice. Explain to the viewers what that guard told you when you first got to USP Big Sandy about the knife. Can you explain to them what he said? So anytime you go to a federal prison, when you get there, you have to go to R&D and you wait and you meet with the SIS, you meet with the captain, they come in a room, they talk to you about the prison, they ask you if you know you got a sex offense, if you're a rat, if you're scared to go out on the yard, they ask you all that stuff. So they're asking me all those questions and then the guy tells me, look, 
The only advice I could give you is don't get tattoos on your face and get a knife. And I'm like, mm. get a knife. The, the, this is a captain and an SIS lieutenant telling me that I should get a knife in federal prison. Damn. And that's when that's when I said all the stories I heard about Big Sandy, this shit's real, man. That's right. That's right. That's crazy. How about um when you when you okay, when you got sentenced and you got sent to USP Big Sandy, how long did it take before you started going into the law library and doing all that stuff? Well, probably a month or two, right? I started hanging out down there because I was just tired of all the nonsense in the unit. And I just felt like, you know, people always make up stuff, you know, to cause tension. To, and I, I just wanted to separate myself from it because it was, meant, like I said, mentally exhausting. So I found some solitude in the law library. You know, there were a few guys down there fighting to get themselves out of prison that really cared about getting out of prison. So I found some solitude down there and, and I started working on my case, reading my own stuff, you know, sending stuff to my attorney at the time. And I ended up winning my own direct appeal, my first direct appeal. I wrote a bunch of stuff and my lawyer just, you know, made it a little better because I wasn't an expert by any means at that time. So, but I put most of that stuff together. We went in, we won. And we won off what I filed in the district court while I was in the county jail pro se. They took that and converted it out at the appeals court. And that's how I ended up winning. But it was off my own stuff. Okay, wow. And let's speak about um, support. How important is letters and visits in prison. Did you have that? Well, like you said, I'm, I'm from the hood, man. I got a crack case, right? Most of the people on my team were black, right? right. How was I the leader? You might want to question that. But my mother's poor. My, my father was a dope fiend. He was a heroin addict. I talk about that in the book. You know, my father died. My brother had killed himself. So my mother was poor. So I only got one visit when I was in Big Sandy. It was hard for my mother to get up there. And then it had been like eight years after that, I seen my mother. So I didn't really get visits from my mom. I had some women that would write me, you know, kind of like fans or whatever, I guess they would write me. And, and I had some women fly in from Germany to come visit me, things like that. But visits, visits are definitely important, brother, because you feel that connection. You feel that connection with your, with the people that you love, that you care about. But I can tell you this, and I'm sure most people that come on your show can tell you this. When people do leave visits, like when I see my mom and I got closer, I got to New York and I would see my mother and my stepfather and my sister. When I would leave those visits, I'd be extremely depressed and I'd lay down and I'd just go to sleep. It was just like natural, just instantly depressed. Okay. So, and letters, let me tell you something about letters. Everybody's looking for the mail every day. That's that's what brings joy to your life, a letter. And if you get a letter that's only one paragraph, you're like, damn. You're like, you really right. want some stuff to read in there. So got you. Letters are important. Okay. And USP Big Sandy, USP Lee. Which one is, 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 as far as the violence go, are they, are they neck and neck? No, let me tell you this. The only prison that I've ever been in that could hold a match to Big Sandy was USP Polak. Big Sandy was an animal of its own. Now, did people get killed in USP Lee? There were more murders in USP Lee than Big Sandy. But there were a whole lot more stabbings in USP Big Sandy than USP Lee. You could go to USP Lee and do your time, right? As long as you stayed out of the way, you were cool. Things happen. People get killed there. I've seen people get killed in USP Lee. Things happen there. But really, it was a lot of men that respected men there, more so than Big Sandy. So, And you had a lot of good dudes, man, that ran cars, like the guy I talked about, Cedric Dean. You know, the shot callers over there were good dudes. When there was an issue, you could fix it. Me and Dog spoke about, you know, an issue on the on, on my uh, Blood on the Razor Wire TV and there was a there was two incidents, and he spoke about one of them where there was a race issue where a guy stole some heroin from this white dude, a black dude did. The white dude beat the black dude up. I had told him at the gate, hey, don't do nothing. Wait until we get the people out here. We're gonna talk, we're gonna fix this. He said, All right, I got you. I said, wait until the first rec call. He didn't wait, he went in there and he jumped on the dude. He was kind of a big white dude. The black dude was a little dude. This stuff is not supposed to happen. So now I'm on the yard with like 30 people, white dudes, and there's like 300 black dudes. They come to the gate, hey, the white dudes did this. They jumped on dude when there's really a no hands policy. So, and I say this by the grace of God for real, they opened the tower, racked the guns, let us know that, hey, this thing's about to get busy. I had about 12 white dudes with me at the fence. I had to walk probably 500 feet across the yard with all these black dudes all over, just staring at us. You could hear a pin drop out there. So I told these white dudes, we're going to go over to the white section, just follow me. And, and someone had to be the leader, brother. Someone had to make that happen. So I shot over there, got everybody at the table. 
me and dog ended up, he was, dog was a guy that cut hair. He had a poker table. You know, he had a good relationship with a lot of the black dudes over there. So he opened the door for me to kind of speak. I spoke a little better than him and we fixed it. But I'm telling you that that was probably one of the most or second most fearful situations I've ever been in because I knew we were outnumbered. I knew we were in trouble. Yeah, we had some knives out there. We had some big rocks over by the tables, but it could have got ugly really quick. But we were able to politic it out. We fixed it because you had men that respected men. You didn't just have men that were looking for problems. Okay. And explain to the viewers um, what a no hands policy is. Okay, no hands policy is um, if I'm white and I got a problem with a black dude, I can't put my hands on that guy. If a Mexican has a problem with a white dude, he can't put his hands on me. What they do is they go to the shot callers, they talk about it, figure out what's going on, they fix it, or we get busy either way. So that's what a no hands policy is. I'm not, I'm not supposed to put my hands on a black dude. Black dude ain't supposed to put his hands on me. Okay. And I know when you was in prison, the prison, the law library was basically your job. But let's put that aside for a second and speak about what trades did you learn in prison that you can use when you get home? Well, it wasn't really necessarily trades that I learned in prison, right? What I did was years later, I hooked up with Cedric Dean. He taught me how to teach GED classes. He taught me how to speak. He pulled me in to teach a curriculum that he wrote that leaders breed leaders. So what I learned was how to speak to people, how to teach people. That was that's what I learned. But it was something that I enjoyed because I was that 24 year old that came into prison with a 40 year sentence. Now I've seen these young dudes from New York coming in 19, 20 years old. And I'm like, these guys are going down the wrong path. They don't see it. And I would have people that wanted their legal work done. And I would tell them, look, I'm going to help you. I'm not charging you, but you got to get your GED or you got to right. come to the Alternative Violence Project seminar. And we try to, to raise these brothers up so that they won't, don't go out there killing people, so that they can be real men, real leaders, real fathers. Because that's what the vicious cycle is. There's so many, and I don't care what color you are, right? I want to see your kids succeed. But if you don't have a father figure in the household, you're going to repeat that vicious cycle. That's just what the statistics tell us, right? You're going to repeat that cycle. And we try to stop that stuff, both myself and Cedric Dean, by educating people, educating these young brothers, letting them see that, look, there's more to life than this. And I can tell you right now, I made more money now since I've been out of prison than I ever made selling drugs. Wow, that's what's and up. Now. And let's back up to that. Let's, I'm glad you, that's a good segue. Let me back up. What age, I know these questions, I, I know. I'm, what age was you when you first started selling drugs? When I first start, started selling drugs, I believe I was 13. Wow, man. Mm. Okay, and what age was you when you started selling crack? You elevated, right? I know it. I want to say that was in probably around 1996, right? Powder cocaine was the thing. I ended up going to state prison on a two to six for an assault. When I was 16, got out when I was 19, I believe. And when I came home, it wasn't powder cocaine no more. Now it was crack. I went and tried to get a job. That didn't work out. I took my first paycheck, bought a quarter ounce of crack, and never looked back. Ended up with a 40-year sentence, bro. Okay, let's now you just open up something new real quick. We're going to get ready to close this part one. We got to do like four four parts if you up to it let me ask you this so you did a two to six in state prison at age 16 yeah where'd you what state prison did you go to as crazy as this sounds i started out in like a medium prison got in an incident over there me and my co-defendant he was like my brother we went to another prison and my co-defendant's like my brother man we grew up together he's you know he, he was involved in you know the blood gang and all that stuff in new york we end up in an incident in wyoming I got stabbed in the face over there. They wow. transferred me across the street to Attica State Prison, which is infamous for the 1970 riots. I was 17 years old in Attica around wow. murder charges. I've been to Attica to visit my brother and that the walls is so high, the weather is so cold, the overcast is so crazy. He said the bell was steady going off. He done been to Attica, Auburn, all those places. Yep. But let me back up to Wyoming, you know what I'm about to ask you. What did the stabbing, how did the stabbing occur? What was going on? Were you selling in there? Were you moving stuff? How did that no, come what about? What happened was, as crazy as this is, my brother loaned a basketball magazine that he got to another dude, Spanish dude. So the Spanish dude told him, man, you're dead on your magazine. My brother's a tough kid, man. He said, well, let, let's hit this shower. So he hit the shower. Really, my brother beat him up, dropped him. He got up, and he acted like we jumped him, but we didn't really. My brother just beat him up. So his people came. We were, we were in there working, man. At 17 years old, we're working. They stabbed me in the face, 
stabbed my brother in the face like eight or nine times. But for real, we left there bloody, but we did all right back then. We're tough kids, man. We're from the hood, man. That's right. Irish and Scottish. You know what they say about the Irish today, St. Patrick's Day. Not no disrespect to any of your viewers, but they say we're the blacks of Europe. We were mistreated. We we were starved to death by the English. So we're tough kids, man. Tough fighters. You see tough fighters like Mickey Ward. You know, right. we're all Irish. We're tough kids, man. Okay. And as far as the state prison go, did, did a lot of the problems you have come from you being white, you think? People Where, thought in state they prison? Yes. Well, let me tell you about this, right? In state prison, I'm from Rochester, so... We were like a gang in state prison. It didn't matter if you were black, Spanish, whatever. We stuck together pretty much. But we had just went to Wyoming. We were there 14 days. It was on Christmas Eve. We got transferred on the same day. And we got stabbed on Christmas Eve. A lot of people didn't know us. So, no, we didn't really have any problems based on race because if you're from Rochester, like when we were in Gowanda together, we were like a gang. Blacks, whites, Spanish, we're together. Where we're from, we're together. Got you. And um, as we close this one, how was it, man? being 17 years old at Attica Correctional Facility. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you I'm a tough kid, but when my mom came to visit me with my great-grandmother, they started crying. I got teary-eyed on the visit, like, man, I'm scared. I told right. my mother, I'm scared. But fortunately for me, I, my father was real close with some guys from my city that was a mobster. And when I went to Attica, they, we were on a visit and my mom said, Hey, that's, that's, this is my son. This is Chuck's son right here. My mom knew the guy. So the dude was like, look, I'm going to get you moved over to the honor block over here. I mean, it was still prison but right. because he moved me over there and he took me on like, Hey man, this is like my friend's son. I was all the way straight. But was I scared when I walked in there at 17 years old? I've always been this big man since I was a kid. So I had a little size, but here I had, I had heart, but up here I was scared, man. Definitely scary. Wow, bro. You 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 have definitely been through hell and back and hell and back again. And now you're back here. That's that's a crazy story, man. Um, how about post incarceration? You doing so how much time did you end up doing on your 40 year sentence? Did 17 years, five months, and 21 days. Wrote my wow. own motion. A long time, man. Um, let me ask you this last question. So after doing that much time. Well, two more questions. Did they have, first of all, how was your adjustment back to society? Did you have a hard time adjusting? Well, when I walked out of prison, I'm like, I'm cool, man. I'm, I'm normal. I'm good. There were a couple things that bothered me. Like I had problems sleeping at night. I sleep with a knife. Sometimes I wake up, I got a knife in my hand, but that's from so many years of that. And I live in a really nice neighborhood now, right? Like I upgraded, I changed my life. So, but I'm still nervous. If I hear anything, I'm jumpy because I've been locked in a cell for so long. You know, crossing the street, I was scared of cars, very afraid. I still don't really use my credit card because I don't know how to, you know, you got to put the chip in there the right way or right. something. Well, I put it in there wrong one time and I felt like people behind me were looking at me like, what's this dude, a dummy? So I try not to really use the credit card. I try to pay for things with cash or if I got someone with me, my girl with me or anything like that, I have them, I give them the card, put it in there, you know? So my adjustment was a little tough and my parole officer told me, hey, I'd like you to, uh, you know, go to do some mental health stuff. And I felt like that was a good thing too, to go, you know, do that. So I go there, you know, like once a month, talk to them, but I'm not crazy. I'm not like some dude I'm doing it because, Hey, maybe it is all right to talk to people after spending so many years in prison. I had spent a year in solitary confinement. So that that's what messed me up right there between me and you and your viewers. Yeah. That, that messed me up. Wow, man. And what I got to I got to ask you this now. What what the hell you got a year in solitary confinement for? It's a long time. I was under investigation for um a couple different things back gotcha. then. Okay, okay. And last question before we close this one. When you after doing that much time, man, when you came home from prison, did they have any job placement programs in line for you to succeed? Like here you go, Chad, take this packet and go see Mrs. Bonnie. And then after that, you'll be all set up and we'll get you going. Did they have that for you? No, that stuff, that stuff to me don't happen. I couldn't even, I had money and couldn't even get a place to live. I put on there, I was a felon and they knocked me down. So I didn't really even have a place to live. But um, I came out there in COVID-19 as well. So that made things a little more difficult, but I made it clear that I was my own business and I was putting a business together. It was up and running already from prison, which was the Freedom Fighters Paralegal and Prison Consultant Firm with Lisa Jacoby. We were partners. She ran the Federal Defender's Office. So I pretty much 
felt like, you know, I worked for all those years for 15, 20 cents an hour. I'm not coming out here to work for nobody but myself. And gotcha. I'm going to make a difference with the work that I do by getting brothers and sisters out of prison, man. That's what's up. And with that being said, explain to the viewers, what is it you do now? Talk about your book and anything else you want to say before we close this one. Well, I got I started a YouTube channel as well. It's called Blood on the Razor Wire. Our mission is to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death in the streets through our stories behind the wall. I'm going to be doing interviews, you know, some lives where I'll answer questions about prison. If parents got, you know, their kids going down the wrong road, I can answer those questions, give some advice. The mission of Blood on the Razor Wire is not just interviews, though. We're going to do other things where I'm going to do some talking. I'm going to tell people about prison, some of the stuff that you talked about. What is a car? What are knives? What's the food like? What's some of the most dangerous things I've seen in prison? We're going to do all that stuff. I got a guy, I think I wrote about him in the book called The Baby, where the I'm going to get him on here. He was in Big Sandy. He was almost killed. He was 20 years old. He should be on here next week on Blood on the Razor Wire. They sent a 20-year-old in there that was 135 pounds. And, you know, he was beat up real bad by the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, almost killed him, jumped on his head. They did some bad things to him. He'll be on the show. I got another young guy that went in at 18 because, like I say, the mission is to save kids from life imprisonment. I got a guy that went to prison at 18 for selling bath salts from the suburbs, came to prison, became a drug addict, Got out of prison within three years, and he's he's on the wrong path right now, but we're going to try to help get him into rehab and get him to change his life so that he can be an example on Blood on the Razor Wire to show these other kids, whether you're selling drugs or you're getting high, there's a different path, and I want him to be the example. And I want to be a part of helping him achieve that goal so that we can show other people. That's what's up. And how many people have you gotten released? Through all the years, honestly, I've probably got 100 people out of prison. Whether wow. Whether it was a time cut, sentence reduction, whether the BOP took four or five years from them, I got all that stuff back. But gotcha. I get it back because I do the work. And and you see me boast on Facebook, and I do that for a reason. Because I'm not one of them dudes that's down there begging people to let people out at the White House. I tell people all the time, I get it the long way, the hard way. I get it in the office, man, from 5 in the morning till 7 or 8 at night sometimes. Damn. So I'm going in there to win. If you got an issue, we're going to find it, and, and we're going to win it. Or we're going to do everything we can to win it. That's right. Hey, listen up, man. With that being said, this is Easy Win, Florida Prison Talk. We got Chad Marks, Blood on the Razor Wire. Make sure you get that book. I got mine off Amazon. It's a great read. I give it 10 out of 10 stars, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on here with him. That book is fire. It's a page turner. It's no idle time in that book. You don't got to skip pages, page by page. Y'all need to go check out Blood on the razor wire and i also promoted this book months ago before i had this interview so you know it's official i appreciate all the subscribers i appreciate everybody tuning in and make sure you guys go check out chad mark's youtube page blood on the razor wire he just interviewed a guy that he was locked up with named dog and dog speaks about the stuff he's seen in usp big sandy dog speaks about being stabbed in the neck it's it's go 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 to that youtube page Go like and subscribe to that YouTube page. Easy win. Florida Prison Talk. We out of here.